little bit. <laughs> Dude, the paper was blown for a second there. But, like a bit shot out. Yeah. Now, it's not to say that glow sticks are a particularly safe mixture normally, but I'm pretty sure that this takes the cake as the world's most terrifying glow stick reaction. I've just taken a calling it the glow stick of doom at this point. That red glow comes from a special form of oxygen that is produced in the reaction. But this is way too dangerous for me to do in my lab, so we're going to take a little trip and visit Nile Red. There's actually a small smattering of videos and images of this reaction, but far as I could tell, most of them are recorded with a potato, and I've always wanted to see it in high def. This is a reaction I've wanted to try for a really long time, but the only reason I'm doing it now is because I can use Niall's fume hood, as it's just not safe to do otherwise. So don't attempt this unless you have one, it's not safe to do outside. So what is the reaction? Well, it's actually really simple, and we're going to look at two variants. All you need is concentrated 30% hydrogen peroxide and a source of concentrated hypochlorite. The same stuff that's in household bleach, though that won't work for this. The simplest version is to drop a piece of trichloroisocyanurate into some of the peroxide. On contact with the liquid, the TCC, as we're going to call it, breaks down to form hypochlorite in solution. This is why it's used as a chemical for maintaining pools. It's basically a puck of bleach. This reacts with the peroxide to produce a lot of oxygen. But even though it's still the dioxygen molecule we're familiar with, it's in a special excited state called singlet oxygen, which we'll talk more about in a moment. This state is unstable and highly reactive, and the molecule wants to get rid of that energy and return to being normal oxygen again. In the short time that singlet oxygen is in solution, it can react by bumping into another singlet oxygen molecule. They both release their energy at the same time, which we see as an emission of red light at exactly 632 nanometers. That's why the red color looks so perfectly red. The rest is just released into the air, where it'll last for a few minutes before decaying. One of the many reasons this is super dangerous is because the whole process liberates a pretty large quantity of chlorine gas along with that reactive singlet oxygen. Okay, now for the more advanced method that's also much brighter. For this, we're going to need to really angry up the pixies in the solution, and we had a few spillovers where the reaction just went completely out of control. This time, rather than using TCC to generate the hypochlorite, we're going to use chlorine gas directly. But for this to work, we need to basify the peroxide with pretty concentrated sodium hydroxide. This way, it'll form sodium hypochlorite and then just sodium chloride as the reaction progresses. The way we found worked best was to dissolve some sodium hydroxide in a minimal amount of water, and then to add some peroxide to it. Do this slowly, as there's a threshold amount where the solution suddenly flares up. It'll probably get really angry for a second, but once it dies down, the solution is primed. We notice that the solution looks vaguely bluish in this state. We think that might be because of dissolved oxygen, but we're not actually sure. For the chlorine, we set up a simple chlorine generator that uses crushed TCC tablets and an addition funnel full of 15% hydrochloric acid. When we're ready, we put the diffusion tube into the solution, dripped a bit of hydrochloric onto the TCC to get some chlorine flowing, and then hit the lights. After a second, it starts getting very bright very quickly. What's cool about this method is how much longer it lasts for. With the tablets, the whole thing was over in probably 20 to 30 seconds, but this went for a few minutes before it finally died down. And as I said, it was also far brighter. That's not to say that every run was this good. We had several duds because we weren't really being overly precise with our measurements and were mostly just eyeballing everything. One thing we quickly found was that you do need a fair bit of base for this to work, but that also tends to really angry up the solution. I estimate it was about a 20% hydroxide concentration that works well, so we eventually figured out a recipe that worked even though we were just eyeballing things to measure things out. Now, this isn't actually the first time we've talked about this reaction on the channel. Over a year ago, I made a video about how you can make the actual Death Star laser, and my idea centered around massive chemical lasers. Chemical lasers are neat because they can provide enormous amounts of laser power instantly as soon as you mix the reactants. And as long as you can provide fresh reactants, they can keep running indefinitely in theory. This reaction is actually about 85% of one of those reactions used in the lasers, but missing one chemical. To turn this into a laser, you essentially take the output of this nonsense, that stream of singlet oxygen and chlorine, and you mix it with molecular iodine and flow it at high speed through a laser chamber. Rather than the two oxygen molecules bumping into each other to provide a red light, they instead transfer that energy to the iodine. This primes the iodine into an excited state, and some of it spontaneously releases the energy as infrared light. If this happens while the mixture is flowing through an optical cavity, also known as between two mirrors, those infrared photons will start bouncing back and forth through the chemical mixture. This stimulates more of the excited iodine to release their energy. This quickly cascades until you have an enormous stimulated emission of light, all in the same direction. By letting some of the light escape, you now have an enormous amount of laser power at your disposal, on the order of megawatts potentially. That's more than enough power to shoot satellites out of orbit. And so long as you keep the flow of gas coming, it can operate continuously. 
Though as we discussed in the previous video, these days they use an even more dangerous mixture rather than this stuff, as it provides more power and doesn't require tanks of peroxide reacting to produce the singlet oxygen. Everything just starts as gases. But back to the singlet oxygen itself. As I mentioned, it itself is a really weird form of oxygen. Oxygen is an interesting molecule because in its resting state it has two unpaired electrons and is known as a diradical. Electrons have a property called spin, and for electrons there are only two options, up and down. Electrons orbiting a nucleus normally pair up so that you get an up and a down in each potential orbital. The same is true when atoms come together to form molecules. The electrons that form the connection typically pair up. But with oxygen, the stable state is the unpaired electrons each take their own orbit and point in the same direction. This actually makes oxygen a very inert molecule for the most part, as it can't react with anything in this state. For that to happen, it has to be knocked into an unstable singlet state, where the electrons come together and pair up. There's all sorts of things that can catalyze this, and the simplest is heat. Once in the singlet state, it'll quickly react so it can return to the ground state, which is why oxygen is such a powerful oxidizer. As a gas, singlet oxygen can be stable for 5-10 to 10 minutes at least. So other than looking awesome, and its uses in terrifying lasers, what are the other uses of singlet oxygen, and where does it show up other than in the glow stick of doom? Turns out, it's actually pretty common. People often talk about antioxidants being healthy for you by protecting you from so-called reactive oxygen species. Well, internet, meet your tube full of reactive oxygen species. Singlet oxygen is one of several free radicals that can form in your body, and so there's many systems in your body to deal with this. And it's helped along by ingredients in many foods that, once inside, can scavenge these radicals preferentially, so they don't react with important things like DNA. Sometimes scientists and doctors actually use this in reverse to our benefit. Certain compounds, including many biological molecules, can absorb light of a particular wavelength and catalyze normal oxygen into singlet oxygen. So by giving a patient a sensitizing molecule, they can zap an area with a laser that doesn't burn them, but instead induces singlet oxygen formation at that location. Some groups are using this as a new potential cancer therapy to kill tumors. It's also useful as an oxidant in some chemical reactions, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Really, I just wanted to see this amazing reaction for myself and get it in high def so y'all don't need to. Before we close out, I just want to say a huge thank you to Nile Red, and you should absolutely go subscribe to his channel. He has an awesome collection of chemistry videos on his channel, including a glow stick or two of his own. This almost definitely won't be the last time we do collabs like this. I've got another Fumehood only project coming up that I'm just finishing up some apparatus for, so we'll be back to make synthetic opal at some point in the future. So be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. And that's where I think I'll end this video. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that keep the flow of science videos coming. Of course, be sure to check out my other social media pages, especially Instagram, to see when I post these projects and more long before they make it into videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.